I can, just for you. Thank you very much. If I can figure it out. Is that, is that tall enough? Yeah. Short enough? Yeah, it's even shorter than I am. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name's Jeanette. I'm a member of the Worldwide Fellowship of Alamont. Now go ahead and cry and get it out of the way. Um, but um, I do appreciate Beth's primary purpose asking uh, us to speak tonight, and you do kind of get to hear the other side. I did say Al-Anon. Uh, for those of you who think you might have heard something wrong, um, give me about 15, 20 minutes, and I'm going to sit down, and you'll hear the other side. You will get an AA uh, talk tonight. Um, I'm kind of, I guess, what you call the warm-up band for the big band that's coming. <laughs> warm-up here, so here we go. Um, but yeah. Uh, but um, uh, I uh, know that I'm supposed to, well, actually, um, uh, I was going to say that uh, uh, AA and Al-Anon kind of work together. Every now and then we have an AA, uh, Al-Anon that unfortunately stops in the AA room uh, by mistake, we think. Um, but once the AA meeting gets started, um, somebody usually brings them down to Al-Anon, and usually that person is Stephen. Um, of course, he's got their life history by the time he gets to our room. Then he opens the door and he introduces them and he says, I hope you make them feel welcome. And I cannot help resist asking him if he would like to join us. And he says, no, I'm not that sick. <laughs> Which we then immediately have to explain to the newcomer that we're not as bad as, you know, some people think we are. So then, every now and then, uh, I have to go down and get a newcomer's packet or some money from Stephen. And somebody cannot help but say, hey, Jeanette, you've decided to uh, join us. And I'll say, no, I don't have the desire. Um, so that's what kind of al and AA have kind of given us is uh, a little common bond, but a little laughter in our home as well. Um, and, and that's a good thing. Um, I did have a desire. My desire ha was to fit in. Um, I never, I, I was born into a loving home. Uh, I'm the middle of three girls. There was no alcohol in my home. My parents were basically teetotalers. Um, but uh, I never felt like I fit in. And I hear AA speakers get up and say that they never felt like they fit in. And Steve and I have talked. If I had had access to alcohol, there's a possibility that I would be in the rooms of AA instead of Aladon. But my drug of choice uh, was food. I stuffed in food to stuff down feelings. Um, I was never pretty enough, smart enough, thin enough, tall enough um, to, to me. Now, my parents never made that, that difference. Uh, you know, we, we had everything we needed. Um, we didn't have everything we wanted, but we learned not to want everything because we knew we were loved. My older sister um, was, uh, you know, and I, I was a middle child. My older sister, when she was born, had some health issues. And so she was always kind of cared for and looked after. And of course, then when the younger sister was born, that's the baby. And you're always the baby. So I was the middle. So I learned at an early age to be a caretaker, a caregiver, an enabler, a people pleaser a big people pleaser. Uh, and I learned that very young. Um, my mom was a school teacher and a home ec major, and she worked all day, and that's where I, I learned to cook from my mom. When she came home, I learned to cook, and I would have meals ready. My dad was dean of students at ASU, worked all day, sometimes late into the evening, and then when he got home, he had to till the garden and cut the grass. I can till a garden, and I still cut grass to this day. but. I didn't just cut our grass. The lady on one side of us was an older lady, so I cut her grass. A little while later, two retired school teachers moved in on the other side of us, and I cut their grass. The couple in front of us, older couple, it sounds like we lived in a retirement village, but we really didn't. But the couple across the street from us was an older couple, and I cut their grass. So I push mode for about two or two and a half hours. Um, just, you know, Again, uh, got to be good, got to be better, and, and, and people pleasing. Um, my younger sister went to UNC, um, which my mother always said that was the ruination of her. Uh, but um, she called home one time, she needed a dress. There was a dance. So I proceed to go to the store and try on dresses. Now, if you know my younger sister, she's a foot taller than me, she's got legs up to here, she's very 
well, she's pretty. And so I'm trying on dresses, and I'm pulling out here, and I'm pushing up here, and all this stuff, and I buy a dress, and I send it to her, and it works. You know, heaven forbid she should buy her own dress. Um, my older sister graduated from UNCG. She got her master's at ASU. Um, she had to go and defend um, or talk about her exam. She was running late, so I'll go. Uh, now, my older sister graduated in deaf education. I'm lucky to know Mama, Daddy, and I love you in sign language, but I'm going to go and defend her exam for her. It, it's the definition of insanity, just doing and doing and doing to fit in to please somebody. Um, now, again, there was no alcohol in my home. My dad was the oldest of three boys. They didn't have an alcohol problem. My mother's the youngest of 10. She had no problem with alcohol. She had two sisters that never married that didn't have a problem with alcohol. And she had a brother that died of old age, no problem with alcohol. And then she had one other brother. And boy, did he love beer um, to excess. When he would overindulge, he would travel about 200 yards down the street to where I had two aunts that lived, and they would take him in and until he straightened up, and then he could go home, and his wife would unlock the door and let him in. Now, when the Brooks girls were there, that was us, um, my parents were from here. Um, so we spent weekends, holidays, vacations, anything. We came down here. So when we were here, he wasn't allowed to stay there because they didn't want us to know he had a problem. We knew, they just didn't think we did. So he'd go back down the road about 100 yards and he, my aunt owned a store that had a room in the back with a bed and a bathroom. And he was allowed to stay there until he straightened up and then he could go back home and his wife would let him in. Um, alcohol resulted in his death. Now, my mother had five sisters, so I have five aunts on this side. No problem with alcohol, but all five married alcoholics. Two of those men died before I met them. One died when I was young, and two I watched slowly uh, the effects of alcoholism and what it did to them. But not only did I watch those men, but I watched those women. And those women were strong women, and they cared for those men. They cooked for them, they cleaned for them, they made sure they had everything they needed, they uh, fed them, they drove them around. And I watched that from a young age. And subconsciously, maybe consciously, I thought what a great way to be an enabler and a people pleaser and to be able to take care of somebody. So I set out to find an alcoholic. <laughs> and along came Stephen. Um, now Stephen was living with my older sister when I met him. It um, beautiful blue two-story Victorian house in Carthage. And um, he came home one evening. I was looking out the window. The house actually had been converted into apartments. My sister lived upstairs, and Stephen lived downstairs. And there's a guy that lived around back, so they weren't really living together. But um, uh, he got out of a blue Ford Ranger pickup in a plaid shirt, pressed jeans, and black Reebok tennis shoes. And it was like an arrow appeared over his head that this is yours. This one is your alcoholic. And I thought, this is great. So, and I knew he was an alcoholic. Um, I don't think any little girl dreams of, you know, growing up to marry an alcoholic, but um, it has been a ride, a, a good ride, I would say. I would encourage marrying an alcoholic, actually, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, if not for the alcoholic in my life, I would have never found Al-Anon, uh, which I'm truly grateful for. But um, I still was living in Boone. Um, my dad died at the age of 54 with a stress heart attack. And I knew my mother would move back to Carthage. Uh, she had family here, my older sister was here, and I would be in Boone. Um, now I had friends in Boone, but family was here. Stephen was here. 
So I proceeded to come to Carthage, apply for a teaching job, and I got that job, and I moved down here. And Stephen and I began to see each other a little more. Um, I would note that he, or notice he would come home from work, he would change, he'd go right back out. And I finally said, where are you going? And he said, well, I'm going to AA meetings and there's a place for you too. And that was my introduction to Al-Anon. Uh, my first Al-Anon meeting was across the street at Bronson and I loved it from the moment I got there because they were my kind of people. They understood me and I understood them. Um, they, I learned in Al-Anon that no was a complete sentence. I didn't have to explain anything. I, you know, or I had an appointment at 11 o'clock. You asked me to do something at 11 o'clock, and I'd tell you I'd do it. Somebody else would ask me to do something at 11 o'clock. I'm already double booked, but I'm going to accept your challenge, and I'm going to make it all happen. And in Al-Anon, I learned I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to please everybody. I didn't have to do for everybody. All I had to do was take care of me. Um, it, it, which was such a relief. The insanity went away, the craziness went away, and the calmness soon learned to take over. Um, it, it, it was just great. Um, in Al-Anon I have learned that I can't control what's on the outside. I can only control what's on the inside, and that's me. Um, Stephen and I, uh, we, we married, obviously. Um, we'll be married for uh, 15 years on June the 26th. Uh, you need to mark that in your calendar. Not because we've been married for 15 years, but because it's also primary purpose's 17th anniversary. So I'm not one of those Al-Anon, and I hope I never become one of those Al-Anon that says, oh, you're going to another meeting tonight? Do we have to go tonight? We'll be spending our anniversary here with basically a second family. Um, it's kind of like a first family though because it's a family that understands and accepts me for who I am and for that I'm truly grateful. Um, again, I wasn't born uh, into an alcoholic family, uh, no immediate alcoholism in my family. So when I started, did start coming to Al-Anon, I kind of felt that maybe I wouldn't fit in, um, but I was accepted uh, for who I was. Um, many of you know I taught school. I just retired last year with 31 years, and I had a saying in my room that said, you are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars, and you have a right to be here. So I learned I had a right to be here, and I had a right to be happy, and I had a right to take care of myself and nobody else. Uh, many of you also know that uh, I didn't know Stephen when he was drinking. He was 12 years sober when I met him. Um, he wasn't an active alcoholic, but he's an active alcoholic. Um, he goes to take meetings to detox. He takes meetings with a group of people to Samaritan Colony. Um, we've been through a big book study together. And because of that, I think it gives us a common bond or a common thread that makes our marriage a little bit stronger. Um, I never ask him what goes on in his meetings and he never asked me what goes on in mine. We know the boundary, we know the line, and we know what it takes. Um, I've seen active alcoholism. Um, I've been on a couple of 12-step calls. Uh, when you're in the truck and the phone rings and you're needed, it's either go or get thrown out on the side of the road and I don't think I'd survive too good on the side of the road. So I have seen active alcoholism, and that is something that I don't want in my home. So I encourage Stephen to go to his AA meetings, and he encourages me to go to my Al-Anon meetings. But he wouldn't have to, and I wouldn't have to encourage him either, because it's something that he wants to do, and Al-Anon is something that I want to do. Because in Al-Anon, like I said, I learned that the only person I can control is me, the only person I have to really care for is me, because if I don't care for me, I'm no good to anybody else. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen.